We welcome you to another edition of the official Titans podcast presented by Farm Bureau Health Plans. The OTP always features Amy Wells. Hello, Mike. How are you? Oh, I am so good. Better now that we're doing another edition of the OTP. Everybody's together because guess who's back? The great Jim Wyatt from TennesseeTitans.com. I'm here. I'm in a rocking chair, so I've been rocking in and out of the picture here. Oh, don't do that. <laughs> Stop doing that. Please, please discontinue that. And, of course, the man who is the spokesperson for Farm Bureau Health Plans himself, <laughs> Coach Dave McGinnis. How are you? Hi, right, guys. It's so good to see you. You know what I said earlier? I feel like a puppy whenever somebody comes in the house. I'm so happy to see you guys. You know how, how your dog's always so happy to see you, like you've been gone forever and you've been gone for 10 minutes. I miss you guys. This is great seeing everybody. All right, so we are in the hours. We are literally down to hours before the NFL draft on Monday. Titans head coach Mike Vrabel, Titans general manager John Robinson spoke to the media. Jim Wyatt? What, if anything, jumped out to you? We had a dog barking through the conference call. That might <laughs> Coach Mike was referring to a little bit earlier. He didn't give up too much. You know, uh, you know, he said that, you know, as usual, he's open for business as far as a trade goes. You know, potentially did, didn't necessarily bother him if the team had to move out of the first round as long as it could get more picks. You know, the Clowney question came up. Uh, uh, Davian Clowney obviously has been a topic of conversation around the NFL and the Titans have been linked to him since John Robinson expressed an interest in him a couple of weeks ago and, and said what the team does in the draft certainly could impact what happens with Clowney. They may circle back to him before the draft or after the draft. So we'll have to see what happens there, but didn't reveal much. I mean, he knows how to play this game and uh, talk through some of the issues that the team and teams across the league will be dealing with, with the, with the different draft this year, obviously a virtual draft, opposed to, you know, how we've seen it so many years in the past. Amy, what, if anything, grabbed you from the pre-draft news conference on Monday? You know, John Robinson was kind of walking us through the technology aspect and what things are going to be different. And I was surprised by the amount of different channels that he is going to be a part of and be plugged into all at once. He has his scouts on a separate channel from some of the people who would usually be in that war room, which is a separate channel from all the other 31 general managers. He's going to have a lot of moving parts and a lot of different screens that he's going to be monitoring. So I'm interested to see how all of that unfolds. And it was, it was cool for me to be able to get a little bit of an insight into what that exactly is going to look like come Thursday. Coach Mack, as you talk to your friends, colleagues, everybody that you know around the league, what are you hearing about the technology and the concerns that people have, if any, going forward in this process? Well, some are more challenged than others. And I think, uh, you know, since we've been in to this situation for, for a while now, people are getting more comfortable with it. I talked to some people after their dry run, and it was a little challenging at first. I think the mute button is the big thing that everybody has to get used <laughs> to, to, you know, when everybody is hooked up. I mean, but just learning how to operate it. But the overall feeling is, is that we're going to be okay. We're going to be fine. You know, uh, Amy referenced, you know, what John Robinson, how many different areas he's going to be hooked up to and, and hooked into. And I, I think, look, I think all of the IT departments in the National Football League are very, very accomplished. I mean, in this day and age, you hire those people to do that. And then plus, I mean, you know, John Robinson is very, very tech savvy. There are some general managers and some head coaches that are not as tech savvy, but they are going to have some help with it. And so to me, the, the biggest thing I came away with is we were, we were, we're interested to see how it works, but we're also looking forward to making it work. Not anybody that I talked to said, we just don't like this at all. Nobody. I got that from nobody. Coach Mack, let me stay with you for just a second. Jadevian Clowney has not signed with anybody at this point. And obviously, Titan fans are very interested in that because the Titans' name has been mentioned with him on multiple occasions. But why has nobody signed the big man yet? What is 
he waiting on and or what are teams waiting on? What everybody was waiting on early, I mean, we, we said it several times, and here, here, here's what it is. They're waiting on the money, okay, because the money is, is up there at a high, high range. And also, you know, they're waiting on, on the physical because nobody's been able to physically get their doctors in front of him or him in front of the doctors. And so they're not going to make that move now. And look, the way that we're doing things virtually right now, now anyway, there really is no rush. And now with the draft coming up, I would anticipate people waiting until after the draft to see what that draft, you know, has brought in that position to see where they're lining up now after the draft with the positions they're able to to accumulate and then they'll revisit it the same teams that are interested in him now are going to be interested in him after the draft interesting answer jim i want to go to you on this because someone brought this point up to me and i didn't know it largely because the titans have not been in line for a compensatory pick in quite some time But if you sign a free agent after the draft, he does not count towards the compensatory formula. So whatever you've done, whatever you've lost and gained as of the draft, that determines your compensatory formula for 2021. How much of it do you think are teams right now saying, let's wait till after the draft because we want to make sure we get as many picks next year as possible? Certainly a factor, and I've heard people speculate that being potentially the reason the Titans are waiting, that if you wait, sign them after the draft, then you're going to get a third-round pick for Jack Conklin leaving. I I don't know that you – that teams are necessarily doing it because of that. Yes, it would be an advantage, but you play that game, then you're certainly putting yourself in a position to have somebody else jump out and get them. So I think you – you know, you've got to factor in, like like Coach Mack said, his health – and the questions are around uh, what he would do as far as the physical is concerned, the money part of it. I and mean, you mentioned the big man being on the market. Well, the big man wants a big a big contract as well. And he initially said he was going to play for twenty million a year. You know, he's now said maybe seventeen to eighteen million. I'm working on uh, my most recent mailback. Somebody's asking me about whether he potentially play for a one year prove it deal for twelve to fourteen million. That, that's up to Jadavian Clowney, and I, I don't know whether he's willing to do that or not. So uh, you've got a lot of factors you have to consider. And you know, I think when you mention Clowney and some of the things that surround him, there's one other free agent that's, that uh, played for the Titans last year, Logan Ryan, finds himself in a similar situation that, you know, you money is a factor. Health's not necessarily a factor with Logan, but money's a factor. And the, the, the danger that some of these players will be faced with, if, if the team that's interested in them right now decides – to pick somebody in that draft and uh, and addresses it with multiple picks at that position, you're probably going to lose a, a, someone who is courting you at the time. So uh, a lot of things to factor in, and the compensatory pick is a good question, certainly a part of the equation. Speaking of staying in, Amy Wells, you've started doing a new feature for the Titan social media channels, checking in with Amy Wells, where you've spent time checking in with former – and current Tennessee Titans players, as you have recorded these and as you've talked to these guys who are having to stay at home, both former players and current players, is there a common thread that you're hearing amongst all of them? Well, it's interesting. Everybody is trying to stay in and just take it one day at a time. But with current players specifically, Every single guy has talked about getting back to the basics in terms of keeping their bodies ready for what will happen when we eventually are able to return to our training facilities. Guys are doing a lot of like push-ups and sit-ups and things that a lot of guys have said, I haven't done this stuff since high school. You know, I talked to Rashawn Evans and he was like, I feel like I'm getting ready for the the state championship game now instead of getting ready for the Super Bowl. But these are the types of things that they're doing. They're really getting back to their roots, I guess, when it comes to training. And it's been really interesting because we know that teams are trying to keep up their kind of routine training plans that they have for individual guys. But a lot of guys are just ditching the equipment and ditching some of the things that they've gotten used to as NFL players and are just really going back to like Rocky style workouts. So that's been cool to hear guys um, really taking it like back to the garage to get get their bodies ready for the season. 
Coach Mack, a lot of what is being discussed right now with the virtual offseason, I, I think a quarter of the team started this week. The, the rest will start next week, and we'll be able to go three straight weeks. From your understanding, what you're hearing, what will they be able to get done during the, the virtual offseason that they're going to get a chance to start having? You know, I, I don't think you'll have the big team meetings because that's a lot of people, you know, to, 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 to put on to, to, to one screen at one time. But I think that when they break it down uh, to their individual groups, both defensively and offensively, and then down to the subsets of the, of the position rooms, you can get your installation in virtually. That will be no problem. You can get that in. You can get feedback. You know, just like we're getting feedback from one another right here, visually you can do it. And so they will be able to, they will be able to get, you know, all of their, all of their uh, installation in, you know, once they start, once they are able to start doing that. I liked what Mike Vrabel said. He has, has told his coaches, they've met as a coaching staff about keeping it basic to begin with because that's going to be extremely, extremely important to get everybody back on the same page. You've got to get into the football mindset. That's what's the great thing. When they all come back together in the facilities like they normally do, you know, you leave all of the off-season thought process behind you, and then you're back into the, the NFL team concept. Well, now they're going to have to translate that team concept virtually, and he wants them to get back into that mindset and that mode first but, but you're going to be able to do it. I, I, I spoke with a, a, a college coach about the way the NCAA is doing it. The NCAA started out just allowing their coaches four hours a day with their players. They're upping it to eight hours next week, okay? And so clearly you can get something done, and they will get something done. The Titans will be very organized. I do know that. I want to mention right now that this is the OTP presented by Farm Bureau Health Plans. Healthcare coverage from Farm Bureau Health Plans is like an extra set of pads when you need them the most. They've been protecting Tennesseans since 1947. Farm Bureau Health Plans. You know I love the fact that Farm Bureau is now sponsoring the OTP. I know. I absolutely love that. That is fabulous. You are the face of Farm Bureau Health Plans. How did you get that gig? I'm not the face, but I'm a big fan. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> is coach back are you doing yours from the oval office or from maybe a room at the biltmore hotel it's just the spare room in east nashville that's where <laughs> I'll, I'll invite you i'll invite you to this room sometime jim that's where he plays clue with his friends <laughs> <laughs> so and so with a kid in coach max fancy room it's like they filmed the movie knives out uh maybe in that room. there you go jim wyatt do you believe, and then Amy Wells, you get to go next, followed by Coach Mack. Do you believe that former Alabama quarterback Tua Tungavaloa is falling towards Thursday night based on health concerns? It's funny, this, this draft, there's so much floating out there, just like every draft. I suspect it's true just because of the injury questions that he had coming out of college. And then you heard more rumors about some other injuries he had that were never disclosed. The teams have not had the opportunity to do uh, as much research and get as much medical information on him as normal. So I I believe that that is in fact true. I think he is sliding in this draft. I agree. I think that not being able to get hands on with some of these guys, and especially someone who had such a big injury that had so many questions around it, I think that teams are going to play it safe. If you were hot on him to begin with, you're still hot on him, okay? If you were cold on him right now, you're cold on him. Because people knew going in that he was injured. I mean, you knew this. Now, Jim's point as far as to not being able – I tell you who did get to see him. Every doctor of every team saw him at the Combine. Every doctor of every team saw him at the combine. And if they didn't, they have all the combine information. So if you as an organization need a quarterback and you are a Tua fan going into the 2020 draft, you're still a Tua fan. If you were on the fence, you're probably leaning to the other side of the fence right now. But I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a, it's a real dramatic fall, no. Do you think he gets by the Chargers, Coach Mack, at number six? I think he gets by the Chargers. Wow. To me, if there's any movement in this first round, 
this movement is going to be for quarterbacks. The movement always is for quarterbacks. You heard John Robinson, he's already started talking. The, the drafts I was involved in with clubs, you know, before, you know, I started doing this. I mean, you're, you've already been on the phone for quite a while. And, and you're talking to people, you're texting people saying, hey, you know, you got time to talk about this. Does this interest you? So I think he'll get, get past them. Yes, I do. I'm not so sure the Chargers will be there. Wow. Well, that's strong. All right, so let me ask you this. And you start with this, Coach. Okay. Why, why in the world are the New York Giants talking to Oregon quarterback Justin Herbert? Do you know Dave Gettleman? I don't. Okay. Look, Dave has been at this a long time. And, and, and you talk about guys that are old school, that are, that are running drafts. He's probably as old school as it gets. You used to do a lot of this stuff. Very, very important to do just exactly – for the reason that you asked the question. He's got everybody else asking, why are they talking to him right now? He's got everybody else asking that question, not focusing on who they may pick, or he might be fishing for somebody to come up to get him, thinking, if I want Herbert, I better move if he's truly disinterested in it. All right, Jim White, I got one for you. Jacksonville supposedly has Yannick Ngakwe, the defensive end who signed a franchise contract, and Leonard Fournette on the trading block. Do they deal one or both this weekend? I think they deal both. Uh, and there's some bad blood, you know, brewing even more with Ngakwe on Twitter uh, earlier this week. Got into a few a little war of words with the owner's son, which uh, got pretty ugly and got pretty personal. And uh, I don't know if you can repair that one, to be honest with you. And then the Fournette, you know, a buddy of mine, uh, Ryan O'Halloran, who now covers the Broncos that, uh, you know, previously covered the Jaguars, you know, made a point over the weekend that usually when the Jaguars start floating players out there uh, as far as trade bait, that they're done with them. And, uh, and the fact that he is being mentioned as somebody that they are willing to move tells me that they're moving them. So I say both of them are, are going to be uh, on the move at some point before the 2020 season, whether it happens during the draft, after the draft, but before the season starts, I think I'll be surprised if I see either one of them playing against the Tennessee Titans as a Jaguar. Is anybody happy to be a Jaguar right now? <laughs> <laughs> Doug Marone. How many players have tried to get out of there lately? I mean, I'm serious. I mean, you think about it. The biggest news you hear out of Jacksonville in this whole off season is who wants to leave. That's not good. I say send them to the NFC. Good riddance. See you later. <laughs> I mean, they've already got two number one picks. Jacksonville has nine and 20. You wouldn't think they could get a number one for Fournette because running backs generally don't go for that kind of market when they're traded. But what do you think they could get for Fournette, and, and what do you think Ngakwe could bring? Well, I don't think they'll get a first-round pick for anybody just because they've already floated it out there right. that, that they want to move them. And so that tells you that, you know, they're going to be available somehow. To me, during the draft, to Jim Wyatt's point, if somebody really needs, you know, somebody to rush the passer badly and, they, and they are, they are, they're out, their pass rush board is dry, they may say, okay, we will give you – to me, if they're traded – they may not be traded for this year's draft. They may be traded for futures. And so I think there's a possibility that they will both be moved during the draft because especially on the second day, second and third days of the draft, you, you as a club kind of have an idea now how your, your, your roster is fleshing out. And so if somebody says, look, we're really void here. Here's what we can do. Here's what we'll give you. Here's what we have left in this draft. Here's what we've got possibly left for next year. That's what I think will happen. All right, let me go back to you here, Coach, for this one. Washington's head coach is Ron Rivera. You coach Ron Rivera through his entire time in Chicago. You know him well. Washington does not have a general manager currently. Supposedly, they're going to hire one after the draft. So people figure Ron Rivera is making the picks this weekend. If that's the case, is there any way in the world any chance that he does not take Chase Young? I don't think so. You know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of, and, and it's, it's interesting that we're talking about 
you know, that Ron Rivera and John Fox have got the same type of connection with it with this. When John Fox, you know, had that job down there in Carolina, he had a chance to get Julius Peppers. And I talked to Foxy before before that, and he said, you know what? There's no way. I don't care what we need. Anybody would need this guy. And I think that's exactly what Ron Rivera will do. You you can never have too many guys that have a special ability to put pressure on a quarterback. You know, the sacks will come, but just to put pressure and make somebody when they're offensively game planning say, look, we're going to have to turn our line this way or we're going to have to chip this way. Chase Young is that dude in this draft. He is that dude. The next dude behind him is Chase on, but he's not what Chase Young is. I think Ron Rivera will stick right there and take that play. All right, Jim White, back to you here, and we're going to get all three of you to comment on this. You have said, as you've gotten questions in your mailbag at TennesseeTitans.com, that you believe the Titans will draft the best player available at number 29. And you're not saying regardless of position. I, I, I know there are certain positions they probably wouldn't go, but your point is they are not bound to one or two spots. Am I interpreting what you're saying correctly from what I read? Yeah, I think best player available at a position of need. And what I mean there is if, let's say, a quarterback happens to fall, I don't think Tua Tagovailoa is going to be around at 29. But if you had somebody that fell, some people might consider them the best player. But I can't see the Titans taking a quarterback. So, But what you have to consider going in this draft, I, mean, I think the Titans have so many – areas that could be addressed that there's a lot on the table and that includes defensive line that includes cornerback that includes offensive tackle edge rusher even a running back I mean as crazy as that sounds if somebody special is sitting around um, and you move back and could get extra picks I could see the team doing just about anything other than taking a quarterback a kicker a long snapper an interior lineman? Yeah, an interior lineman. I think best player available at a position that could that could make an immediate impact. And a quarterback is not going to make an immediate impact for the Titans because they have. The team has its quarterback. Amy, when you hear that, how does that strike you, knowing what you know about John Robinson? I think that Jim summed it up perfectly. I think that pretty much anything is possible for this Titans team within reason. You know, sure. I don't think anything bananas is going to happen. But John Robinson said it himself. He loves moving around on draft day. He loves to have all of these options. And we know John Robinson. We know that he's had all kinds of lines in the water seeing what will tug. So I think that Jim's absolutely right, that there's, there's not a lot of things that could be surprising to me, anyway, come Thursday night. Coach Mack? Yeah, you know, let, let me expand a little bit on what Jim said. Say you get to 29. And, 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 and believe me, John Robinson will have already talked to people before they're on the clock. You know that. We all know that. But you get down there, and there is a position of need that's there that has more of those players of position of need. This is where your horizontal draft board comes into play. This is where you take your vertical draft board out of it, and then you start to look at your horizontal board. And that's why it's so important because now – Say you're down there with a corner and you've got four corners kind of grouped in the same spot, or you get down there and there's a and say and say there's an offensive tackle and you've got tackles kind of in the same spot group for the next round, and you start talking to trade partners that would be within the range that you think some of those may be that could help you get a player similar that you have graded very similar and then pick up extra picks. That's the way I think he will go. I don't think he's going to zero in on one person. I think once he gets to 29, he will zero in on his horizontal board and zero in on pods of players and positions. Because when you pod players up, you compare them not only to the players that are in that position, but that are horizontally across the board in the different positions are in the same pod. All right, so let me stay with you for a second, Coach, and I want to go back across to Jim next and then to Amy. If you had to rank the odds of what the Titans are most likely to do in the hours leading up to the draft, would trading back be the number one on that list in terms of the most likely scenario, Coach Mack? In my mind, yes. Jim Wyatt? 
I agree. But it really just depends on who's there because if you've got a cluster of players that you like and you can move back and assure yourself that you're going to get one of them uh, in a position you move back to, then that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Amy? I think that's number one for me. Okay. I want to do something else. Jim White does something at TennesseeTitans.com that I just love. I, I love your look at the mock drafts. <laughs> and you did 50 of them this week? Usually when you do them, you have the majority of the people taking the same position, the same player. They're, they're all over the place in the, you know, leading into this year's draft. All right, so we're going to play the game. Surprised if they take him or not surprised if the scenario happens. Amy, Jim, then Coach. All you have to do – no, it's fun. All you have to do is say surprised that the Titans took this player or not surprised. You ready? Sure. All right. Marlon Davidson, defensive lineman, Auburn. Not surprised. Not surprised. Not surprised. Isaiah Wilson, offensive tackle, Georgia. Not surprised. 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 Trevon Diggs, cornerback, Alabama. Not surprised. Not surprised. Not surprised. Brandon Ayuk, wide receiver, Arizona State. Nice. Surprised. Surprised. Ah, Coach Mack. Coach Mack. <laughs> I love Brandon Ayuk. I know. <laughs> not surprised. That's not the game, Coach. Not, not surprised. Not surprised, he says. Justin Jefferson, wide receiver, Louisiana State University. Surprised. I'd say surprised. Not surprised. Ezra Cleveland, offensive tackle, Boise State. Not surprised. Not surprised. That one does not surprise me. These are ones, again, what the game is here on the OTP <laughs> is I'm mentioning guys who have been put with the Titans in mock drafts, and I'm just throwing out the names. I'm asking our panel – would you be surprised if they end up with the Titans or not surprised? The next name, Josh Jones, offensive tackle, Houston. Not surprised. Surprised. Ooh. Surprised. Austin Jackson, offensive tackle, Southern California. Coach Max seems very strongly nodding here. I'm going to go with not surprised. I love how Amy loves this game. Oh. I don't love this game. <laughs> I would say not surprised. Not surprised. Ross Blacklock, defensive line, TCU. Bro. <laughs> not surprised. I say not surprised. Not surprised. Yatur Gross Matos, defensive line. Edge player, Penn State. Surprised. Not surprised. Not surprised. Kristen Fulton, cornerback, LSU. Surprised. Not surprised. Not surprised on that one. Zach Bond, edge rusher, Wisconsin. Not surprised. Not surprised. Surprised. Jeff Gladney, cornerback, TCU. Frog. Frog. <laughs> not surprised. Not surprised. If it's a frog, not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy Chen, safety, Southern Illinois. Oh. Surprised. Surprised. Surprised, but nice name. Yes. <laughs> These have all been mentioned as Titans in mock drafts that Jim had at TennesseeTitans.com. A.J. Epinesa, outside linebacker, defensive end, Iowa. Not surprised. Not surprised. That surprised me a little. Jalen Johnson, cornerback, Utah. Not surprised. I say surprised. That would surprise me. Andrew Thomas, offensive tackle, Georgia. Not surprised. I say surprised. Yeah, that, not surprised. You'd be surprised if he's there, wouldn't you, from what we're oh, reading? Yeah. A lot of these names, a lot of these names. I like this game, though. Uh, it's a good game. 
Jonathan, Jonathan Jonathan Taylor, running back, Wisconsin. I would be surprised. I say surprise. You know, Swift was in there before, and he got replaced uh, by one of the guys doing the mock drafts. Uh, I think a running back would surprise me. It would be a nice weapon to have. You can only have one pick, Jim. Surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Terrell Lewis, outside linebacker, Alabama. I'd be surprised. Not surprised. Surprised. Denzel Mims, wide receiver, Baylor. Mm -hmm. I'd be surprised. 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 That's 20 different names mentioned with the Titans in the mock drafts. That's why the draft is so great. I mean, it really is because there are 32 different rooms. Now there's a lot more different rooms than that. But there's 32 different decision makers, and that is why this is such a great exercise. But I love doing that exercise, and the biggest reason I love doing it is watching Amy Wells' face. Oh. It is, it's so worth it to me. It's a treat. I don't like it. <laughs> Coach Mack, do you have a favorite player, regardless of round, in this draft? A favorite football player? Just a favorite, yeah. Just somebody you just like, man, I just love this guy. I love the way he plays. It's not doesn't matter which round. I just enjoyed, I just enjoyed watching him play ball. Amik Robertson from Louisiana Tech. Oh, is he, is he the next honey badger? That guy, I tell you what. You know, for DBs, uh, being able to stay in phase, then being able to be competitive at the catch point, and then just have a dog mentality to you, I love the way this kid plays. It's so much fun to watch him play. And I don't – I mean, he's 5'8", a buck 85 maybe, but that dude plays ball. I love watching guys that love to play ball. He loves to play ball. 14 picks in three years playing down there, had a chance to go to LSU at the end of his recruiting process and said, nope, I'm going to stick with my commitment to Louisiana Tech, and then became all world there. Mike Dettelier, who is best friends with Ed Ogeron, yes. uh, best friends since childhood. Literally, there it is with his Mike D guide. Here's mine. Got my Mike D guide right here. Amy, you didn't get one? I've got a yeah, Mike has mine. Mike Detelier says it's Ed Ogeron's biggest mistake since he became head coach at LSU in terms of recruiting. A Meek Roberts. Wow, that's a that's a great that's a great story right there. When you watch him play, if you like watching ball, watch this kid play football. I'd love to coach that kid. My favorite player, and I have an SEC bias, I admit it, but Clyde Edwards Alaire from LSU. Is my I think the guy is just a ball player. I know he's five seven, and this is the year of short backs too. I mean, Swift is five eight, and there are a bunch of them who are five nine. Uh, McFarland, I think, from Maryland is five eight. But I love Edwards Alaire. I, I like his fierceness. I like how he runs inside. He's got a little Emmett Smith to him. Uh, does it seem like he should get through holes that he does? He can catch the ball. I love this player. Gets in the end zone. Um, I think somebody's going to steal him on day two. Jim, do you have a favorite player? I have an SEC bias, too, I admit. Jerry Judy. I just like the way he plays. I like his speed. I like his ability just to kind of glide almost and still race past defenders. Uh, I think he's going to be a special pro. All right, Amy Wells. You can't say somebody from Missouri. I mean, I guess you no, can. No, I won't. But here's my thing. My chance to evaluate this crop of players has been taken from me because the pre-draft visits have all been moved virtual. And that right. is where Wait. I fall whoa, in Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, so and let's tell everybody, Amy gets to interview players <laughs> on pre-draft visits. And so she gets to know them. And she, right. always, has, she always has her views based on – not only the tape, spending time with Coach Matt, getting the feelings from that, but you, you get to know them. I get to know them, and okay. I get to have conversations with them. And so I didn't get very many this year, so I'm going to have to just pick Justin Matabuke. Matabuke. Out of Texas A&M. I've enjoyed watching him. I've had a chance to watch a little bit of his tape and some of the things that he does. 
and holy smokes, he is a big dude. So that's my favorite player that I'm rooting for. And I wouldn't mind if he was a Titan. You know who has been training him getting ready for the draft? Former Titan defensive lineman. Who? Sean Smith. Well, there you go. See, he's part of the family already. Where does Matabuke go in this draft, Dave McGinnis? He'll be in the second round. He will be in the, in the top third of the second round. He's a good-looking player. Good, mm -hmm. He's a good player, and he, he just he plays consistent. Nice pick, Amy. I mean, that, 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 that kid likes to play ball, too. All right, I got one more for you, Coach, before we go, and that is the post-draft scramble for the undrafteds. Wow. And for and for those of you who have never seen it, the four of us have had the chance to see it. Coach Mack has obviously lived it. The other three have witnessed it. You have people running throughout your building with phones, going into different rooms, doing recruiting, talking to players, talking to agents, trying to gather this class together. It would seem like the undrafteds are even more important in this draft because – you're not going to know as much about your back end guys. The guys with questions, big questions, probably aren't going to get drafted. You may be able to get a better player in the undrafteds than you can on day three. That being said, how are they going to handle this? How are teams going to handle this without everybody together in the same building? Let me give you a little insight on what goes on. First of all, you start to you start to put this group together early, and you lean on your area scouts hard. And what you do is you assign an area scout with a position to the position coach. And so you're the secondary coach. I'm the area scout. I'm assigned to all the free agent DBs. I, I've got all their numbers. I've got their agents. I've got everything. And then I come to you. This is prior to the draft saying, look, if this is this, is this is this, and you, you categorize them A, B, C, or D. You categorize them for th those four categories for three reasons. The first is for want. The second time, the reason you do is for the amount of money you're going to spend because you've got a finite amount of money that you can spend on these free agents. Each club has the same finite amount of money. So if you go out and you give $20,000 to one, well then that means you're not gonna be able to give as much to another one. So once this starts and once you get around that sixth round, how, how good a job your assistant coaches and your area scouts have done prior to the draft of staying in touch with these guys, and you never call them and say, hey, look, when you're not drafted, you don't ever say that. What you do say is, look, we really like you as a player. Good luck in the draft. God bless you. You know, if it comes up and we have a chance, maybe something will work out. If not, and just say you're not drafted, we'd love to get a chance to be able to talk to you because you would be a great fit for what we're doing here. You go through who, who all you have on your roster, everything at that position. You'll try to involve the position coach sometimes if it's a real high priority free agent. Look, this thing is, this thing is organized chaos. It really, really is. It's a lot like the floor of the stock exchange. Right. Some guys over here saying, I got so-and-so. How much did you give him? Ten grand? Okay, we've got this much less. Look, I've already offered him ten. You can't. We're out of money. Take that away. It's it's a pretty amazing process. I loved it. It's the Wild West. It is exactly the Wild West. And it's really going to be the Wild West with everybody not in this, you know, with people not able to run down the hall and say, guy says he'll take two grand more. He'll come if we'll give him two grand more. And, you know, whoever says, yeah, we'll sign off on that. Now, who do you call? You hit it. This is going to be interesting. You know, just a note, if Seal Bracado, who I, I really love, <laughs> God bless CO. Taught me more about scouting than I, I could ever, ever, I can never pay CO back for what he did for me. When he was going after free agents, CO had no boundaries. CO would, <laughs> you know, would offer guys so much money and come in. I got him. How much are you offering? 12,000. CO, we don't have that much. Oh, we'll figure it out. So he would just go, CO had no boundaries. You finally had to say CO. And it, it couldn't be anybody, couldn't be anybody but Floyd or Jeff Fisher would finally have to say, CO, you're done. The free agent. <laughs> <laughs> you know what he did with Brad Castle? Remember that, what he did with Brad Castle? Tell the story. I mean, Brad Castle from North Texas that played for, you know, played for me. I love Brad Castle. 
one of the toughest dudes I've ever coached in my life, just real country tough. All right. Love the dude. Okay. But, you know, we were trying to get him. And, and I mean, and Brad Castle couldn't run out of sight in a day. I mean, you know, he couldn't, but he made a lot of tackles at North Texas. CO loved it. Texas kid, tough kid. And so CO, we're trying to get him. And some said, well, what did he run? Don't worry about what he ran. Well, well, you know, and so Floyd's trying to, to help CO out and, and enhance Brad Castle's profile and said, well, does he long snap? Yeah, he's a good long snapper. All right. We, we sign him as a free agent, bring him in. About the second day, Alan Lyer said, Brad, come on down here and snap. And Castle goes, why? And he said, well, <laughs> snap, didn't you? He said, I never snapped in my life. He said, did you snap in high school? No, hell no. So, see you over, God. He was a quarterback in high school. He, that's what he's saying. He goes, I was a quarterback in high school. I didn't log snap. Oh, my, but you know, <laughs> you know what? He was a good player. Oh. So, see you over, right. I love Brad Castle. Brad Castle is one, he's in my top 10 just just because he's Brad Castle. Correct me if I'm wrong, but Brad Castle had a an interception in the season finale against the Lions, I guess in 2004 and 19 tackles and so we're reviewing the film. Thanks Jim White. Another coach Max story. And so we're <laughs> reviewing the film with Jim Schwartz at the end of the season, all right? We finished on a high note. We really finished pretty strong. That team wasn't very good that year. Yeah, cost ourselves the number two pick in the draft by winning that last game. Yeah. Ended up with Pac-Man Jones. Yeah, it was really, it was really great. Thanks for winning that, Coach. Well, that's another story. <laughs> anyway, anyway, we're watching the film as a defense, you know, with with Jim Schwartz, and we're watching and watching and watching. And of course, I've already graded Castle's film the night before, and I take it in. I said, Schwartz, you're not going to believe the game Castle had. 19 tackles. I mean, every one of them documented. So we're, we're watching it, watching it. And so the players, when we're watching the tape, the last day in there as a defensive team, they start cheering for Castle every tackle that he makes. And Keith Bullock was a huge Castle fan. And so, so at the end of the meeting, everybody jumps up and starts cheering. They carry Brad Castle on their shoulders out of the defensive meeting. Room. <laughs> Amy, I, w I wish you could have known Brad Castle. There has never been another Titan quite like him. I would say for what Jim Washburn was as a coach, and I love Jim Washburn, Brad Castle was as a player, two old school outlaws. Oh, a nice analogy. That's yeah. perfect. Coach Mike, you, you probably got some insight, more insight on how Brad Castle tore his Achilles, I think at a barbecue on the 4th of July. He was down there with all of those other yahoos that he grew up with. It was, <laughs> it, was, it was the 4th of July. It was on a homemade cement picnic bench. So you can imagine what that was, okay? And after about 78 beers, he sat on the edge of that thing, okay? And it tipped, and the whole cement block of the seat came down and severed his Achilles, okay? Oh, I know exactly oh. how it happened. Oh. It was a family picnic with quotation marks around family. <laughs> he came into training camp and tried to hide the Achilles for about three days. I was doing my individual drills. I said, Castle, have you worked out one inch this summer? I said, what is wrong with you? Because he wasn't the fastest dude anyway. But I mean, he was slower than smoke off snow going through those drills. I mean, it was amazing. And so finally, you know, we got him in there to Brad Brown and they looked at him and said, coach, oh my, oh man. Oh, when he went in to talk to Jeff Fisher, it was amazing. But he played with that, didn't he? No, he well, he tried, Mike. He 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 had he had to get it fixed. He, oh, he, he tried early on, but it was. I know exactly the story. I lived it. Yes. <laughs> and you didn't even ask about the story about him getting a fight one night on the caravan either. That's another whole. That's thing. your story. That's, That's your story. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't, they didn't tell me about that for a year. They they hid that from me for a year. He went to an establishment, and uh, I mean, these were you know, this is a long time ago. Before before these, where you could have the you know, you could take a lot of pictures. Oh man, what was Brad Castle's running mate name that we brought in? Cody. What was Cody's uh, name? Cody Spencer. Cody Spencer. The he was another one too. Uh, no, the wrench. We brought the wrench in with him, and they had been running mates. Brad Castle was was the Cody Spencer's the wrenches mentor at North Texas. They knew the North Texas Police Department and bail oh. by first name. Let me tell you something. This is why you listen. 
to the official Titans podcast presented by Farm Bureau Health Plans. <laughs> this is why right here, if you listen to nothing else, the Brad Castle stories are worth it. And Jim Wyatt, thanks for egging it on. I need to see Coach Mack in a robe smoking a pipe in that. Uh, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> Oh, oh, Jim White at TennesseeTitans.com. Great stories and features. How do people follow you on the social media? At J. Wyatt Sports. And as you mentioned, our website now, TennesseeTitans.com. Amy Wells, how do they follow you on the social media? At Titans Amy, A-M-I-E. And Coach Mack, we're getting ready for big work on Titans Radio. We're going to do the entire first round on Thursday night. Our coverage begins at 7 Central on Titans radio stations. And the entire second and third round on Friday night, our coverage starts at 6 o'clock Central time. Are you ready? I'm so excited about this. I'm so excited about this. I'm just sad when we turn this off that I can't see y'all anymore. Well, I know. It's been, <laughs> it's been so great to be with you guys again. And thank you for the Brad Castle stories. Oh, gosh. I would love to have Brad Castle on an edition of the OTP. I don't know that we could air it, but I would tape it. Do you have any Matt Castle stories by chance? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think Matt, Matt Castle, another great guy, but uh, I'd say those stories are pretty tame. Those stories, those stories are diametrically different. I would yes, say. I would say they're very, they're very different. They would involve Chuck E. Cheese and his children and his wife and lots of happy things. <laughs> He's a good guy, though. Funny guy, too. All right, so for Coach Dave McGinnis, for Jim White, for Amy Wells, for Brad Castle, Mike Keats, <laughs> thanks for being with us for the official Titans podcast presented by Farm Bureau Health Plans, better known as the OTP. Oh,